We, uh, I get on and get off and try to just really be really focused. And I think whether you're dealing with a retailer or a wholesaler, whoever you're dealing with, it's, it's pretty astonishing the, uh, the volume of things that they're dealing with on a daily basis. So by really um, appreciating their time and, and being focused uh, over time, you, you develop a reputation and people actually want to listen to what you've got to say. So with that said, we're running a bit behind. So this is going to be the briefest PowerPoint in the history of the Australian wine industry. So uh, let's let's roll over. So the the, the topic is um, is uh, U.S. retailers, what they're looking for, and how to pitch them. And I think everyone in this room, um, if you don't really have a pretty good core of how to pitch a retailer, I think we're all in trouble. But uh, what I'm going to do here is just do some things that are you know really focused to the U.S. market, and uh, you know especially as to what we're doing today. And you know before I get cracking, I just want to say, Patrick, you know. Authenticity has been tossed around about three or four times already today as a theme, and uh, your presentation was so wonderfully authentic, um, and I can see an international market just really absorbing that because of how authentic it was. You know, you talked of the provenance of Tasmania so proudly, and uh, it, was a, it was a lovely presentation, so well done. Um, okay, let's get rolling. Oh, I've got the ticker. It's me. Why don't I get rolling? Okay, quickly, um, this number was alluded to previously, not exactly this number, but this is a projected number for something that's going to end up happening at the end of the year. So it's an enormous number, 180,000 to 220,000. So any, anyone got any ideas what number I'm tossing out? Yes, mate? That is, no, that's my T&E. That's my T&E. Um, so... It's the approximate number of SKUs that will be approved. I put the FTC, it's not the FTC, it's the TTB. But it's the approximate number of um, SKUs that are going to be approved in the United States for wine and spirits this year. So when you think about, you're walking in front of whether it's a retailer or a wholesaler, these guys have been pitched probably, I don't know, 1,500, 2,000 things in the last three weeks. So whatever you're pitching, you better do it in a very concise manner and you better uh, really have a value, uh, have a proposition for them that's compelling because these guys have an enormous amount of people vying for their attention. So kind of just having a quick think about what the US retailer is looking for in particular, I went back and I had a look at the core mission, the core statement for Australia's uh, wine uh, vision for 2000. Uh, is it 25, Angela, this statement, the one that, uh, the, that Brian Walsh put together? 2015-2020. So for Australia to be the world's preeminent wine-producing nation, pretty lofty goal, talking about diversity, unique uh, regionality, superior terroirs. These are all the things that as an industry we're trying to do. And what is magnificent is our focus as an industry right now is perfectly aligned with what the U.S. retailer is looking for. The U.S. retailer is looking for us to be authentic. They're looking for us to be ultra premium and luxury. And they're looking for us to tell a story of provenance. So it's just wonderful. When, when I was preparing for this, I, I emailed a couple of good retailers and they shot me back. You know, I said, what are you looking for us, you know, as an industry? What do you need? And their requirements are up of us. What they were looking for for the Aussie category was perfectly in line with our mission statement. And it should be a calling card to everyone in the room to have some real definition about what you're looking to do. Okay, so here's, here's kind of what I got back from the guys. The, there's been a core group of, say, 50 brands in the United States that have been fighting the good fight on Australia's behalf above sort of $15 for the last 10 years. And as was alluded to, the retail space that the uh, US retailers have allotted us has shrunk dramatically over the, course of the, uh, over the course of the last decade. What the retailer is looking for is new offerings, exciting offerings that can stir and, and revitalize the category. They're looking for wines with a sense of place. And that's why I just loved uh, Patrick's presentation because he kept working in where the, where the uh, grains were from and talking about Tasmania and the purity of the water and the purity of the environment. So that sense of place 
is critically important. Um, whether we're talking Margaret River, whether we're talking Mornington Peninsula, to be able to talk Appalachian is critically important and the diverse range of wine styles which they develop. The other thing that's really unique to the US market is talking about authenticity in the brand and a number of people have also touched on that today. But authenticity in the United States, kind of the beginning of the end of the initial boom was caused by a lot of wine marketers coming in with virtual brands that perhaps didn't uh, deliver the sort of quality price ratio that, that is needed in the United States. And a lot of people kind of have a, have a bad taste in their mouth about that. So the authenticity of your brand is really something that I'd love everyone to be able to um, articulate clearly um, and, and talk, to the, talk to the retailer. The other thing the US retailer is desperate for us to do is as a category deliver to their business the sorts of margins that the other categories are delivering. Because at the moment, if you watch a US, a broad-based US consumer go into a grocery store and shop, their eyes are at eye level when they're shopping California, when they're shopping the European varietals, and when they get to the Australian category, their eyes drop. And they're no longer looking at the 15 to 20, they're looking at the entry level stuff. And this is, this is the broad based consumer in grocery. I'm not talking about fine wine, but it's just interesting to watch them because they, their perception is entry level and their eyes never made it to the categories that we're trying to drive, which I found really fascinating. But the independent retailers want us to find a way to drive the margin in the Australian category that other categories can deliver. And that's our challenge. So, now this isn't rocket science, this is the same everywhere. Um, the one thing that the US is really unique is they're so uh, ratings driven. There's a real uh, need for third party endorsements. And, you know, it's interesting, the Wine Spectator remains probably the most powerful publication in the US. But it's been interesting to see the rise of certain other uh, media figures. And, you know, five years ago, you never saw James Halliday on a shelf talker. Uh, and, and his influence was minimal. And over the last four or five years, you see Halliday now becoming a, a bigger part of the US market, which is, I think, wonderful for our business, uh, for, our, um, for our, our community. I think it's fantastic. And you know, then there's, then there's your, your standard other guys that are also very influential from, from Anthony Dice Blue to Wines and Spirits and Wine Enthusiasts and, and a whole bunch of others. But you know, the, the third party endorsement in the US is really critical. Uh, probably more so than any other market. Um, we're talking authenticity, we're talking provenance, uh, and we're talking dealing uh, extraordinary value at ultra premium and luxury price points. I think, um, uh, you know, I've heard some, some, some terminology today that I like, that the QPR, the quality price ratio, is something that, you know, coming up with the right terminology, because I think it's, it's funny, you go into sales meetings and one of my distributors, um, he kept note of every time every different winery at a sales meeting on a Friday morning said over deliver. And uh, at one, we, uh, one Friday, he got to the number of 27 uh, during the course of the seven wineries presentations. But we've got to hammer home that point of, of delivering extraordinary value at every price point that we do without kind of using that terminology over deliver because that's been, uh, that's been beaten to death. Um, you know, having a look at uh, a lot of our sort of niche uh, opportunities, driving margin is something that the US retailer needs to do because on the commodity brands, it's so competitive. The internet makes everyone, uh, everyone's prices very visible. So the opportunity to drive margin within the Australian portfolio is a great opportunity for us and it's a great opportunity for the retailer. Um, and then while you're doing that also, your ability to partner with people regionally gives you an enormous opportunity. Now, this isn't rocket science, but these are what the good guys came back and th that's what they told me that they're looking for. Margin enhancement's critical uh, and regional exclusives is also pretty handy. All right, so let's have a quick look at the sort of retailers we're targeting and I'm already wrapping up my presentation. It's very short. But the sort of market, market triggers that, 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 um, that get a lot of other retailers excited. So there's the, uh, the holy grail, which is Costco. And Costco is not price sensitive. They have absolutely no problem selling wines that are uh, ultra premium, ultra luxury, and their price points are, you know, start at 15 bucks and go up to 
you know, whatever they want to sell them at, you know, whether they're selling first growth Bordeaux or, or single vineyard Napa Cabernets, they have a, an ability and a, and a consumer that is just phenomenal. And they're almost their, their sole trigger for purchasing is on reviews and ratings. Then there's other clubs which are much more price point sensitive. So for some of our community that are looking to talk provenance and they're looking to talk ultra premium and luxury, you know, these may not be the greatest channels, but still, at, you know, up to $15, these guys can move some wonderful volume. Um, then you have a look at these specialty retailers, which is really where we should all be looking to build stories and have discussions about because these guys look at ratings, they look at packagings, and they can help tell you your story. So the specialty retailers, the Heinen's in Ohio, the Wegmans, the Earth Fair, the, Mo the Molly Stones in California, just specialty re uh, grocers that really have a great little wine program, wonderful opportunities to build our brands. Um, grocery, I kind of alluded to the grocery situation, you know, at, at our price points where we want to operate above $15, above $20, I don't know if the general, U, you know, US consumer is ready for us on a broad basis yet. Um, getting authorizations in these sorts of places just to lose them initially until we really build traction is a bit scary for me. But if someone's brave enough to do it, God bless you, uh, because they can certainly move mountains of wine. Um, and then there's the, the, the drug chain, and if, if you're jumping in, uh, if you head to the US and someone's taking you to hit the Walgreens and the Acmes, you're probably, your distributor's probably taking you for a bit of a ride and not using your time effectively. So, you know, here's where I think a lot of us can continue to tell our story and build, and that's with the independents. Um, you've got your fine wine guys, and everyone knows who they are on the East Coast and the West Coast, and Binnie's in Chicago. Price point's not an issue. They love telling the story, and, and that's why these guys are a great channel for us and where we really have to focus. James uh, Gosper alluded to, you know, what happens in New York retail eventually filters out through the rest of the country, and he's a spot on the money. So that's where a lot of our effort needs to be uh, invested. Then, you know, there's some interesting players in the internet who uh, have do not flinch at price point whatsoever. Um, they like to work on very lo uh, long margins. They love ratings. They love to tell the story. Uh, and they can, they can really have quite an impactful um, Im impact on your business in a very positive way and help you to get to right, the right sort of consumers. Then you've got your multiple independent units, whether it's ABC down in Florida, Apple Jacks, Bottle King, yada, yada, yada. Th these are just like the independent, uh, or just like the specialty grocers. This is once again where we need to be targeting. They can do great volumes. They can uh, really help tell a story at a premium price point. And then we've got the, the mum and pop units, which you know can be a real tough slog if you're in the trade and you're hitting you know half a dozen of these guys every day, you might sell, you know, four or five boxes of wine and, and you've really put in a long, a tough day at the office. Um, so, you know, targeting your channels for retailers as targeting as well as your pitch is really critical, I think. So um, that's the Reader's Digest version, um, short, sharp and shiny, uh, which, is my, uh, which is my sales uh, calling card. But if anyone's got any questions, I'm going to be floating around and, um, you know, for lunch we can have a chat. Or if anyone's got any questions now. Where's, uh, yes, mate. Yep. So the question was luxury uh, price point. Where's it defined at? You know, luxury is probably plus 25. Uh, and that's my definition. Everyone's definition is probably going to change uh, or just have a little bit of variability. But if you have a look at the IRI or the Nielsen's, you know, it starts, you know, premium and then you move your way up and, you know, ultra premium sort of 15 to 20. So luxury is going to be comfortably above there. Yep. Yes, mate. Yeah, the, the, the question is, if something's retailing here in Oz for 20, how does it line up in the United States? And, you know, I'd put the onus back on you on that one. I think you need to have a look at your competitive set domestically. Um, I don't want to say that it's probably going to be less expensive all the time, but it is going to be less expensive 95% of the time. But it, 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 it kind of behooves you to do your homework um, and have a look at where you want your wine sitting against. Um, and, you know, you might find in, in some isolated incidences you know, you've actually got upward pricing pressure, you know, rather than downward. But it's really important with your pricing to work it backwards, look where your competitive set is. Um, and I think that's the same for everyone. You know, I hear a lot of people talk FOBs, you know, this is my FOB. I don't really care what your FOB is. 
look at your competitive set, work your pricing backwards, and that way you can have a you know sensible discussion with your distributor about where your pricing is, rather dictating terms like this is my FOB. Um, I think it's important you do your homework. Yep. Beauty. Oh yes, mate. The, the question was, is have we seen any lift sort of in, in price point by chain? I think, is that fair, John? Yeah, or they started looking to develop uh, other price points, yeah. you know, to add, uh, I guess, revenue and so forth. Yeah. I saw the one that probably was Kroger, and we've done a little bit with them, and just thought that they seem to be on the track of doing something a little bit more y Yeah, I, 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 absolutely. I, I think... You know, the, the, those were sweeping generalizations I had on there for the Australian wine business. I remember walking into a Publix and seeing a, uh, a Wagner family, which is Camus and Mayomi and all those sorts of the guys. And I used to work for the bloke who runs the company and I sent him a, a text and I was like, you've got a pallet of wine here on the floor, which probably drives more margin than my entire business in the state of Florida. So there's no question these grocery guys can sell expensive wines and are looking to move up the food chain. Everyone's moving up in the US. Uh, the, there's, a real, um, there's a real drive to quality. There's a real drive to um, increase price points. So yeah, please don't take that as gospel. It was just a sweeping generalization, but there's no question that the Kroger's, the Safeways, the Publix are all trying to take that premiumization philosophy and drive it through the wine business. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, mate? So the question was, you know, is Wine Australia sort of actively trying to develop relationships that we can funnel to people? And, and I think, you know, it's a, it's, we're, we're definitely built trying to build relationships and, you know, the job that Angela and the team have done with selected retailers to, to drive business is, is commendable. And, and, you know, the program last year that was run with wine.com was tremendously successful. But I think as, you know, as the commercial aspect develops, that's something we've got to work on. Um, and, and assist everyone to the party. But, you know, as an industry, we, we all need to be doing that together. It can't just be, you know, Wine Australia, can you go get me all the account information? Um, you, know, from a, you know, from my standpoint as a commercial guy, I'd love to do that. You know, that's what I do. I get up and I'm, I'm hungry to go. But I think, you know, you, you, there's so, it's a political minefield. Who do, we, who do we spread the information to and are we showing favouritism one over the other? I, I think net-net we're going to help everyone that we can. And, um, you know, uh, and as that concept develops, maybe we can look at doing something more in depth, but I, it's something that we need to look at and continue to build. Yep. Okay, Ben, um, that seems to be the end of the question. So again, Ben Van Dusser from uh, Wine Australia, appreciate his presentation. Thanks very much. <laughs>